Apostle Paul said it only takes a little leaven to spoil a whole batch of dough. Today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg shows us the clear spiritual parallel when little sins creep into our lives, even ones we think are harmless, everyone suffers. Alistair is teaching from 1 Corinthians 5 about immorality in the church. The issue before us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is the issue of immorality in the church, immorality in general, and in a specific instance, the problem of an illicit relationship of a particularly unsavory kind, which is mentioned in the first verse. The dreadful nature of this affecting the church in Corinth as it did was compounded by the fact that the believers in Corinth were not merely acquiescing to the situation that they found among them, but tragically they were even boasting about who they were and what they were. And so Paul confronts them with the total incongruity of this, and he says, a man has his father's wife, and you are proud. This surely cannot be. And we pick it up in verse 6, looking at the picture which he uses to drive home truth, and this thought is still uppermost in Paul's mind. He says, your boasting is not good. That's a phenomenal understatement. J.B. Phillips paraphrases it helpfully. Your pride in your church is lamentably out of place. And then he employs a picture which would be immediately recognizable to his readers. Some of us would have trouble following just exactly what he's referring to. And so I'd like to encourage you to turn back to Exodus chapter 12 for a moment so that we might set the picture in its context. The story in Exodus 12 is the story of the slaves being liberated from the bondage of Egypt. You remember that they were kept there, and they were serving Pharaoh. Their circumstances were laborious and dreadful. God raised up Moses from the wilderness with the message to be proclaimed to Pharaoh, let my people go. And the exciting story of how the plagues came and Pharaoh relented for a moment or two, and then because of the hardness of his heart, changed his mind and wouldn't let the people go. And finally came this word from God that there would be the angel of death who would come. And then in verse 12, he explains that on that night, I will strike through Egypt, passing through and striking down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Now notice verse 15. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast, or leaven. On the first day, remove the yeast, or leaven, from your houses, for whoever eats anything with yeast in it, from the first day until the seventh, must be cut off from Israel. Celebrate the feast of unleavened bread, because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. He goes on again in verse 19, For seven days no yeast is to be found in your houses. Verse 20, Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Now, that is the background of what Paul now employs as a picture here to show the incongruity of the yeast of sin still being tolerated amongst the lives of those who have celebrated the Passover in recognizing the transforming power of Jesus in setting them free from sin. The yeast was somehow representative of the life which they were leaving behind in Egypt. They were going to a new life. They were going to the promised land. And therefore, on that same day, every year, they would celebrate and recognize by putting in process that which God intended, the feast of the Passover. They would recall the way in which God had delivered them. The clearing out of all the yeast, incidentally, in Exodus 12, was done prior to the Passover lamb being slain, and prior to the celebration taking place. So says Paul, it is quite incredible to me that Christ, our Passover lamb, has already been slain. The celebration is already in process, 
But you folks in Corinth are still tolerating yeast from your pre-converted days. Your boasting, he says, is lamentably out of place. Now, why was he so concerned about this? Well, he tells us, he says, you know, it only takes a little bit of leaven to leaven the whole lump, or a little bit of yeast will have an effect on the totality of that in which it's set. And so he says, whenever a church tolerates that which is rotten in terms of sin within it, then it has a devastating effect upon the whole church. So what are we to do? Well, verse 7 tells us, get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. In other words, he says, be what you are. You are already a complete new batch. You have been made new as a result of your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, you must see to it that on a daily basis you get rid of everything from amongst you as a fellowship that would taint and permeate and spoil. Therefore, sin, while not being impossible, is incongruous. God has come and redeemed in Christ. We have been buried with him in baptism. We have been raised with him to walk in newness of life, which is why baptism is supposed to follow upon our profession of faith, so that the picture of the one ordinance that he gave, namely baptism, would be recognizable in the minds of the believing church, so that the second picture which he uses, namely communion, would be understood to be exactly what it is. Whenever a church compromises by tolerating deliberate, obvious, repeated sin within its fellowship, then that church becomes a charade. It becomes full of insecurity and full of falsehood. So our celebrations is a clear reference to all that is ours in terms of celebrating in worship and in praise, but surely the context points us to our communion celebrations. And so says Paul, when you celebrate in that way, your relationships with one another should not be marked by malice, which is a vicious disposition, nor with wickedness, which is the acting out of the disposition of the mind. But instead, our celebrations should be characterized by sincerity and truth. He says there must be this crystal clear dimension in the body of Christ because without it, it impacts dreadfully upon the watching world. Now, the emphasis, and it's very important that we understand this, the emphasis here is not upon perfection. It's not upon sinlessness, because we know that perfection and sinlessness will only be ours in heaven. The emphasis is upon openness and honesty. It's upon walking in the light of God's presence, and wanting God to shine his light into our lives to expose our darkness so that we may then confess our darkness, know forgiveness for our sins, and go on in harmony with one another. I mean, we'll worry about the world in a minute or two. Let's think about ourselves. Let's think about the darkness which we tolerate. Let's think about the darkness which, as individuals, we tolerate, and therefore the cumulative darkness of a company of God's people. We are as light and we are as distinctive as we are individuals molded into one. Whenever you or I find ourselves tolerating doing that, which is absolutely counter to the teaching of Scripture, then we call in question the reality and the vitality of our profession of repentance and faith. Assurance and disobedience cannot go hand in hand. You cannot, I cannot disobey the clear injunctions of the Bible as an individual or as a church family and enjoy an assurance of faith. Nor should we be able to. Now, that's the picture, then, in 6 to 8. Let me hit with you the principle which he then espouses in verses 9 to 13. He'd written once already, he says, in another letter, 
And what he'd written in that letter was not to associate with sexually immoral people. Now, he says, you got a hold of the wrong end of the stick when I wrote that to you. You misunderstood me. And so he says, I want to clear up the misunderstanding. I don't mean that the people of this world should be removed from our orb of influence or from our sphere of friendship. Not at all, he says, meaning in verse 10, the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, because he says, in that case, you would have to leave the world. Now, Paul is addressing something which Jesus addressed in his day. You remember the Pharisees who were the, the really high-level religious characters? How they were masters at condemning everybody else while tolerating in themselves the same things that they condemned. They condemned sin on the outside while they were happy to tolerate sin on the inside. Now, look at what Paul says. He says, if you were going to have to remove yourselves from sexually immoral people across the board, you would have to vamoose from the world. But what I'm writing to you about, verse 11, is that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater, or a slanderer, or a drunk, or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. Now, loved ones, let us not miss the implications of this this morning. The Corinthian church had grown pharisaical in that it condemned sin outside of itself, and it tolerated sin inside itself. It sought to remove itself from the problem on the outside while acquiescing to the issue on the inside. Now, it's a hard lesson for the church to learn, and I'm not sure just how well the church has learned it at this point in Western society. And here's the lesson. Note this, loved ones. Sin outside the church is not nearly so dangerous to the church as sin inside the church. And what does the church spend its time doing? Doing what Paul says it shouldn't do, as we'll see in just a moment. Congratulating itself with the Pharisee in look whatever, that we are not as other men are, and certainly not like this poor wretched sinner here. When in point of fact, Paul says, no, you've got to focus all wrong. You've got the camera shooting the wrong way. You've got the magnifying glass out on the wrong side. Paul never had monasticism in his mind when he wrote this. He didn't have pietism in his mind when he wrote this. Isolationism of any kind was not in his mind. It was never in the mind of Jesus either. When he wrote the Sermon on the Mount, he was really clear. Matthew chapter 5. He says, you are salt and you are light. You don't keep the salt in that thing. You need it on your potatoes. You don't keep the light under a box. You need it to shine. There's a very clear picture. But the church forgets that so quickly, thinks that it's supposed to have a cozy little place with nice little lights and nice little couches and nice little places for everybody to come in and have a happy time. Paul writes to the Philippians, and he says that you might shine as lights in a dark place, that you may be seen to be without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. He writes to the Romans, and he says, we're not conformed to this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. One of the great questions uh, politically and economically at the moment is the question of protectionism. Shall we protect our trade uh, tariffs, etc.? Is that a good idea, or shall we go beyond that? What is the way to deal with it? How do you deal with the Japanese? How do you deal with West Germany? How do you deal with the dollar in such a dreadful situation? That's not for discussion, that's for illustration. But protectionism is an issue there. And loved ones, it's an issue here. Paul had no notion of monasticism, pietism, or any other form of isolationism when he penned these words. He was very, very clear. He is talking not about us condemning the non-Christian, nor about us condemning our brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, he's not talking about condemning anybody. He is talking about dealing with a specific instance, and that is when someone who professes faith in Jesus Christ lives visibly, willfully, 
and persistently in a way that calls in question their profession of faith, then, says Paul, we are to not even eat with them. They are to be removed from the framework of our fellowship. Now, surely he has got in mind here the breaking of bread. The believers in Corinth gathered in one another's homes. They shared a love feast together, and they broke bread, just as Jesus commanded. And so, says Paul, the guilty should not be included at that time. They should be excluded from such occasions. If anyone harbors enmity against his brother or his sister, they shouldn't even show up until they've at least made it right with that person. If someone is living in willful sin, they shouldn't come in the hope that somehow or another, through the communion service, they will, they will get a feeling in their tummy that will make them not want to do these things anymore. No, no. You should stop doing those things and then come. And if you refuse to stop doing those things, then the church, your brothers and sisters, should say to you, don't come. You're a walking contradiction. Now, you need to read 1 Corinthians 5 in light of Matthew 18 and the process that takes place there. But the examination of our lives, and it should be a personal examination, focuses on five areas of behavior. Notice how he mentions them. Number one, we are to be utterly distinctive in relationship to sex. Utterly distinctive in relationship to greed. Utterly distinctive in relationship to idolatry. While people worship at the idols of fashion and success and of power, we're to be different, utterly distinctive in relationship to the tongue. We're to be utterly distinctive in the matter of alcohol. Ephesians 5.18, don't get drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the person says, hey, I want to get drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Fine, says Paul. If a person does that and continues to do that, don't sit down and have a support group for him. Put him out of the church till he sorts himself out. Can you believe you just heard me say that? I'm telling you, 1 Corinthians 5 is spiritual dynamite. Handle with care. The principle that he is articulating as he draws this to a close is very clear. Strict discipline within the church and complete freedom of association out with the church. What business is it of mine, he says, to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? Well, you said, but I thought it said in Matthew 7, you judge not that you be not judged. Now it says here that you're supposed to judge those inside the church. What does that mean? Isn't that a contradiction? It's an apparent contradiction, but it's not a contradiction. In Matthew chapter 7, what Jesus is saying is, when you see and identify sin in somebody else, Jesus says, let that be a reminder to you of how sinful you are as a person, and you clean up your own act before you go start digging toothpicks out of people's eyes. What it is, is the act of involvement in the life of somebody who is calling into question their profession of faith. It is an act of redemption. It is an act of compassion. It is an act of care. Strict discipline within the church, complete freedom of association outside the church. It's not easy, but it's vital. I believe it's the key to effective evangelism. The tragedy of so many of our attempts at evangelism as churches lies in the fact that we are too remote from unbelievers and we are too relaxed about sin amongst believers. So we failed it right across the board on 1 Corinthians 5. So instead of being distinctive, the church is disguised. When a church lacks in distinctiveness, it takes refuge in judgmentalism. And so Paul says, here's the principle. Purity in the church and penetration into the world are the two complementary responsibilities of the Christians, whether they're in Corinth or in Cleveland or where they are, wherever they are. Let me give you a quote from a man called Pryor, and I'm through talking about the, the church's disinvolvement from society. He says, one of the key reasons why Christians are disengaged from society is psychological. That is, that Christians can't face the problems of the world. They're altogether too big and too bad. Therefore, it's safer for them not to bother about them at all. The most telling index of this attitude is the way we fill our diaries with Christian meetings, rather than make ourselves available for genuinely meeting unbelievers 
in open-ended friendship. How much time have you written into your diary to be with unsaved, non-believing friends and neighbors, and me, and us? And how much have we written into the agenda of our church that has to do not with simply cozying up to one another, but in being reminded of the fact that there's a battle outside and it's raging and it'll soon shake our windows and rattle our walls because the times, they're really a changing. Reminding us to examine ourselves, Alistair Begg is teaching from 1 Corinthians 5. You're listening to Truth For Life, and Alistair will return to close in prayer in just a minute. The series is titled Firm Foundation. If you've missed any of the previous programs, you can find all of the archived sermons at truthforlife.org. There is no cost to listen online. If you've been listening to this program for any length of time, you know that the teaching you hear at Truth For Life is deeply anchored in God's Word. This is very intentional. If we don't go to the source to learn about God, He will remain unknown to us. And an unknown God, small g, can't be trusted or served or worshipped. That's the conviction held by A.W. Pink, and it's beautifully expressed in his classic book titled The Attributes of God. By exploring the characteristics of God in this concise and theologically rich book, you'll discover the God of the universe in a deep and beneficial way. Pink invites us to explore 17 attributes of God that include virtues like patience, love, and so many more. This is a deep book, but it's helpful for Bible students of all ages. When you give today, make sure to request your copy of The Attributes of God. Mail your donation with your request for the book to Truth For Life, P.O. Box 39 Cleveland, Ohio, 44139. Or you can donate and request a copy of the book when you call 888 588 7884. If it's more convenient, you can give online by visiting truthforlife.org. Now, Alistair concludes today's message on immorality in the church with prayer. Just a moment of silence as we reflect upon these things, as we ask God to bring clarity to our minds, anything that is unhelpful or unclear, that we might get clarity to it or forget it. And only that which is true may be burned into our lives. If there are any of us here this morning who are tolerating sin within our lives and bringing it into the fellowship that we might deal with it resolutely and quickly, that you will save us from the kind of judgmentalism which mars and destroys, that you will give us the grace to be bold in discriminating between truth and error, between life and death, so that we might be distinctive, that we might be an alternative community, but that we may not form a little citadel in which we hide from the responsibilities and obligations of our society, choosing rather to call down your judgment on the lives who need your grace. Help us, Lord Jesus, in these things. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine for Alistair Begg and all of us at Truth For Life, hoping you will worship with your local church family this weekend. Be sure to join us Monday when Alistair discusses how Christians should settle disputes. It's a message called Forbidden Lawsuits. Today's program was furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.